There's nothing more mesmerizing, and at the same time, melancholy, than watching the distant scenery pass by from the window of a train. The landscape may change from flat to mountainous and from lush to arid, but your thoughts as you stare are often the same. What is this place? I wonder who lives here and what it's like to live here. I wonder who has traveled here before me. But when you are riding the rails along the route that the likes of Chinggis Khan and Marco Polo likely crossed, it makes your heart beat faster. Spanning five time zones, three distinct cultures, and more than 5,000 miles, this is the longest train trip in the world, the Trans-Siberian Railway. Ride along with us. We're Ann Craig Cinnamon and John Cinnamon, and we both have long careers in broadcasting in Indianapolis, Indiana. Since marrying in 1995, we've traveled the world together visiting more than 100 countries, all seven continents, and all 50 U.S. states. We've done such things as gorilla trekking in Rwanda, hiking the Himalayas to see Mount Everest, hot air ballooning over Cappadocia, Turkey, exploring Easter Island on a scooter, and visiting the eerie ghost town of Chernobyl in Ukraine. When you're a travel junkie, it gets harder and harder to get your fix, which is why we're always looking for something new and different, experiencing something in a more adventurous way. So when we discovered you could take the longest train ride in the world from Moscow to Beijing with stops in Siberia and Mongolia, we were on board with it, despite knowing that it could be challenging. So this trip is a little more nerve-wracking. We don't, we, we don't know what the train's going to be like. I'm so excited to see it. There's a lot of, it's a lot of things that we're not sure about. But is it not one of the most exciting, maybe, that we've ever done? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. When there's, there's a certain segment of our, our friends and people that we talk to and tell them where we're going on the uh, Trans-Siberian Railway, really? I didn't even know there was such a thing. Yeah. That sounds awesome. That Where's sounds so exotic. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we when we, you know, tell them it's wow, that's really cool. And of course then there's the handful of others who say, Oh, we're gonna stay, we're gonna be in a train for four days, maybe with two other people in our cabin. Longer than four days. Right, but four days in a row. In a row. And they say, That sounds awful. <laughs> I would never want to do that. <laughs> With strangers? <laughs> strangers on a train? In a cabin? This close? Could never no do thanks. that. That's what he actually said. What if they pass gas in the middle of the night? <laughs> what if we do? First stop on our more than two week long journey, Moscow. Now you would think that after going through the rather onerous process of applying for a Russian visa and receiving it that you'd be in. But not so in John's case. He was singled out upon arrival in Moscow at immigration for a more extensive search and interview. So we get to passport control at the Moscow airport, and they take my passport and tell me to step aside and wait. I had cleared passport control and turned around to look at John, and he's standing there going... Well, after waiting about 40 minutes, they finally took me downstairs to this small office with, like, Soviet-era furnishings, an old metal desk, a yellow rotary phone. I asked a few people what was going on, but they didn't speak much English, but they told me to just wait. So I picked up our luggage and sat outside passport control and waited and waited. So they start asking me questions like, what are you doing in Russia? Are you going to be meeting with any politicians? Then they ask if they can see my cell phone. What am I going to say? No? If only I had had a working phone, I could have at least texted John, but my phone was dead and he had the chargers. Well, when they asked for my phone, they started punching in a series of numbers and symbols and a screen came up that I had never seen before. It looked like it was a serial number, which they proceeded to write down. By then, passport control was completely shut down and I was still waiting and scared to death. Well, after more than an hour in custody, I was finally free to go, but as far as I know, the Kremlin may still be listening. With that rather unnerving episode behind us, we were on our way. Moscow is a beautiful, vibrant city. Red Square is, of course, iconic. The Kremlin is not at all what you might think. There are beautiful churches inside the walls, and it has served as the government seat for more than 500 years. The colorful St. Basil's Cathedral sits at one end of Red Square, where it's watched over parades, demonstrations, and just day-to-day -day events for over 500 years. This cathedral is actually nine churches in one, 
It may be rather ornate on the outside with its onion dome cupolas, but the inside is not at all what you'd expect of a cathedral, with brick walls and low ceilings and small chapels. I've been to Russia twice and never been inside St. Vassal's before, and I've always wanted to come. And it's better than I ever thought it would be. It's, it's, it's not the gilded churches that you usually see. It's just, it's, it's real, it's beautiful, it's a gem. The third major anchor of Red Square is the Gum Department Store. When the architects designed it more than 120 years ago, it probably never occurred to them that someday it would house designer clothing and jewelry and high-end goods. When I was first here, and that was 1974, it was their big prize even then, and they brought you here as a tourist attraction. But it was really the government, the state store. And yeah. so they would have, you know, the bread shop over here, and the, and the, and the trinket shop, and the, and, the, and, the, and the cheese shop, and the, <laughs> you know, and people would, you know, this is where they shop, but it was, it was nothing like this. Oh, I sure. mean, the architecture is pretty much the same, and it's beautiful. But, it, and it is a beautiful, stunning, beautiful building right on Red Square, but it's not anything the way they intended when they created it. Oh yeah, from the time you were here the first time <laughs> yeah. to now, it's gone from Pravda to Prada. <laughs> Absolutely. Something else Moscow is famous for and proud of is their subway stations. Some are actually considered architectural masterpieces. There are stations designed of marble, Others have mosaic ceilings. And then there's Revolution Square Station, which has bronze statues of soldiers that subway riders over the years have fondly rubbed as they head for their train. After touring, shopping, and dining on dumplings for a day or two, we were ready to start the adventure. Our tour guide, Isa, took us to a local grocery store to buy food. So the thing is that we are going to spend four days on the train and dining car may be not available. or Sometimes you may not like the food and it's always better to have some food on your own. Plus, it's acting like local because locals ah. don't go to dining car. Uh -huh. They prepare everything in advance, like boiling eggs, cooking chicken, wrapping it in tin foil. We cannot do this as we right. don't have uh, kitchen. Right. But we can buy some things and cook uh. by ourselves to, you know, right. be like right. locals. So the locals, they do a lot of preparation Absolutely. before they get on so the train. Absolutely. So train is all about eating. It's, it it's is? the culture. So you once you bought the train, uh -huh. it hasn't started even yet. Right. You start eating. And you're sharing food with the neighbors. So it's better to have something to be able to share. Oh, <laughs> I think we need to shop some more. <laughs> As the time to board the Trans-Siberian Railway approached, we were excited and anxious at the same time. We arrived late in the evening at the Moscow train station as famous train number 100 did not leave until midnight. This was April and it was still pretty cold at night in Moscow and we waited outside to board our home for the next four nights. If by home you mean living in a cramped cabin with strangers, eating reconstituted noodles, sharing two rudimentary toilets with 30 plus people, and not properly bathing, then yes, home sweet home. But that's life for second class travelers on the Trans-Siberian Railway. But at least we had doors that allowed for some privacy, unlike our comrades in the third-class car. Even that is probably luxurious compared to the way Russians traveled on this train a hundred years ago. The Moscow to Vladivostok line opened for service in 1916, and at 5,772 miles, it's still the longest train line in the world. The TSR network now includes branches that connect to North Korea, China, and Mongolia. We'll be taking the Mongolian line to our final destination of Beijing. Our second class cabin is roughly six feet by six feet, with two lower and two upper bunks and a small communal table. With space at a premium, most of the time in our room was limited to reading, listening to music, playing cards, trying some impromptu yoga, or generally just trying to get comfortable. The train's dining car provided considerably more space, so several passengers took advantage of the extra legroom to grab a bite, play games, or just sit and chat. A true testament to the international vibe you get on the Trans-Siberian Railway is this group of women. Two are from Australia, two are from Russia, and together they're playing the uniquely American game of ruthless capitalism, travel monopoly. Most everyone on the train eats in their cabin, with meals made up of non-perishable items or box noodles that can be cooked using hot water from a dispenser available in each car. How's lunch? It's delicious. Our train fare also included one free boxed meal, which we chose to enjoy in the dining car. 
Talia is the dining car manager and has worked on the train for seven years. His wife also works as a waitress in the dining car, while their three-year-old son stays at home with his grandmother. Talia told us the part of his job he enjoys most is the communication with people. And he didn't have to think long about his least favorite. Drunk Russian man. <laughs> which we were able to experience firsthand. This gentleman in the red coat engaging with a British traveler was later wrestled to the floor and taken away in handcuffs. We were told there's a special detention car for just such occasions. Another longtime railway employee is our car attendant, Jana. One part hostess, one part housekeeper, one part ambassador, Jana wears many hats besides the warm furry one. She lives in Vladivostok and has worked for the Trans-Siberian Railway for eight years. Jana told us she likes the job because she enjoys traveling across her country and meeting new people. Are the people friendly, we ask? Mostly, yes. <laughs> and does she want to tell us who's not friendly? We gave John the opportunity to turn the tables on us. If she could ask an American anything, what would it be? Ну, так как у нас сейчас политическая обстановка, сами знаете, какая, да? Просто вообще как они относятся к России? Вот вообще не брать ни политику, ничего, потому что политика там свои игры. А чисто вообще просто вот простой американский человек относится к простому русскому. Well, we can't speak for all Americans, but our experience has been that the regular Russian, as Jana says, is friendly and helpful. And that's why we travel, to see and meet people and get a true sense of them and their country. There are any number of reasons why people travel or take a specific trip in particular. Gareth Marks of London, England has been wanting to travel on the Trans-Siberian Railway for 20 years. What's he most looking forward to? It's just a journey. I mean, Mongolia would be very cool to go and see. But I mean, yeah, seeing Russia, See Mongolia, and I haven't been to China either before, so... But Mongolia, I think, is the height of most people, you know, that everyone wants to see. But before we get to Mongolia, or China, it's more time on the train. Understand, our first four days on the train are not non-stop. In fact, we would make 14 stops at stations along the way before getting off in Irkutsk. Remember, the Trans-Siberian Railway is first and foremost a commuter line, transporting Russians from one town to another. Some of the stops were as short as 13 minutes, while others were close to an hour, giving us time to stretch our legs, get some fresh air, and do some quick shopping and sightseeing. Most stations were little more than a glorified convenience store selling snacks and souvenirs. But others, like this one in Yekaterinburg, were truly monuments to Soviet-era glory. In addition to the ornate chandelier, the ceiling features paintings of famous Russian and Soviet events that happen in this area of Russia, including the downing of Geary Powers and his U-2 spy plane in 1960. Back on the train, recall how we mentioned not properly bathing? With no showers and limited bathroom space, this is about the best you can hope for on board. During our pre-trained shopping trip, our guide had suggested stocking up on wet naps. Hopefully we brought enough. We would still have a ways to go before an actual shower at our hotel in Siberia. Next stop, Lake Bacall. So far, we've traveled more than 2,600 miles across five time zones, and we're barely more than halfway through our journey as we arrive in Irkutsk. The joke among Western civilizations has always been that being exiled to Siberia was a fate worse than death. Well, the early 19th century Russian exiles made the most of it. Because they were mostly intellectuals, they turned Irkutsk into a center of cultural, artistic, and educational prosperity. It came to be known as the Paris of Siberia. From here, we'll take a one-hour bus ride to the small town of Lispyanka, near the southern tip of Lake Bacall. We'll spend two nights here before getting back on the rails. Lake Bacall is the largest freshwater lake by volume in the world, and during our visit in mid-April, the lake is still covered with a thick sheet of winter ice. Although we were assured it was safe to walk on, you can tell some still made the initial trek rather gingerly. Even with the lake frozen over, the locals still take advantage of a relatively warm day to come to the rocky beach and enjoy food, games, a ride on an ATV or hovercraft, or just hang out with their best friend. Families having fun on a lakeside beach is clearly universal, no matter what time of year. We are told that within a couple of weeks, the ice will be gone and the hovercrafts will give way to boats. 
But for now, a hovercraft it is. We took a ride across the lake to this section of track formerly used by the Trans-Siberian Railway. Now they use it for local trains around the perimeter of the lake. Back in downtown Listbianka, the Saturday market is in full swing. Your choices range from fish to, well, fish. Actually, they do have fruits, nuts, and cured meats, as well as a variety of kitschy souvenirs. It's kind of a combination farmer's market and tourist trap, complete with the full array of traditional Russian nesting dolls, or matryoshkas. But not all nesting dolls are painted to look like adorable babushkas. Some are of a more authoritative nature. With our preconceived notion of Siberia as a gray and desolate wasteland shattered by this beautiful sunset, as well as the friendly people, colorful market, and playful families on the beach, we bid farewell to Lisvyanka and head back to Irkutsk, where we'll board the train and head south. This is where we change to the Trans-Mongolian leg of the Trans-Siberian Railway. A new train and new cabin mates await us on the next part of the journey. As the landscape begins to change outside our window, we know that we're getting closer to our next and most anticipated stop, Mongolia. It was our first visit, and we had visions of a vast wasteland of steppe, nomads, and people on horseback with falcons. What we found at our first stop was the very modern capital city of Ulaanbaatar with one and a half million inhabitants. It has tall buildings, wide boulevards, huge plazas and temples. But it also has shopping malls and stores offering all manner of cashmere, since Mongolia is the largest exporter of cashmere in the world. Mongolian barbecue is not something the Western world made up. It's the real deal, and there's cuisine from all over the world available in Ulaanbaatar. Even a little taste of home. Being from Kentucky and having met Colonel Sanders as a child, I can't tell you how comforting it is to see his face pasted in the most far-flung exotic places around the planet. We also took in some traditional Mongolian entertainment with its brightly colored costumes, unique instruments, and a form of singing that we had never heard before. It's called throat singing, and it's amazing and cringeworthy at the same time. The next day we were off to see the real Mongolia, the scenic steppe, the mountains and forests where nomads live among horses and yaks. Almost a third of the Mongolian population of three million people are nomads. That may have been the single most fascinating thing we learned. In an age where so many people in the world live in huge cities and work at regular jobs and go to their homes or apartments, there are still 800,000 people in Mongolia who live off the land and move around based on the weather. These nomads live in what they call gurs, known elsewhere as yurts, which are large, round, insulated and collapsible tents that whole families live in. They take them apart and move them wherever they go. On the way to the camp, we made a stop at this enormous stainless steel statue of Mongolia's favorite son, Chinggis Khan. You know him as Genghis, but it is in fact Chinggis. That's because shortly after his reign in the early 13th century, tales of his exploits were written in languages that didn't have the CH sound, so Chinggis became Genghis. Oh, and that business about him fathering so many children that an outsized number of people today can trace their ancestry directly to him? Turns out that's a bit of a stretch too. The Mongol Empire founder's 130-foot-tall statue, built in 2008, has an observation deck on the horse's head that gives you a panoramic view of the surrounding Mongolian steppe. We traveled for hours across this region to get to our Gur camp, where we would spend the night. Our camp was made up of a dozen or so Gurs, set in a forested area with mountains as a backdrop. It was serene, and the air was about as clean as it gets, except for the smell of a fire burning in the kitchen Gur preparing our lunch. We had a gur all to ourselves, and it was quite spacious, with three twin beds, a sink, a stove to keep warm by, and even a skylight. All the comforts of home. Except, of course, for a bathroom, which was a short walk down the hill. We're not talking about a modern flushing toilet now. It's more like a latrine that they refer to as the long drop. The women got the super deluxe one with the seat and everything. The men, just a hole in the floor. Meals were traditional and delicious, and served in the largest gur in the camp. Our guide, Nemo, which is short for something we can't pronounce, took us on a long midday hike of the surrounding mountains and to a temple that was situated amidst the mountain range with a beautiful view of the valley below. Nemo, seen here with our Mongolian driver, was quite an interesting person. His English was perfect, and we were told his Russian was even better. He had been a doctor, but he made so little working at a hospital in Ulaanbaatar that he became a tour guide instead. His father, who he's only seen once since he was a young child, is still a nomad, and Nemo was born in a girl. As a child with my parents, I live 
until seven. Okay. Until seven. Was it a hard life? Difficult? No. Oh. Not that hard. Only winter time will yeah. be a little bit difficult for people <laughs> who live in a gear, yeah? It's cold. <laughs> yeah, chopping firewood and bringing water from local well every day. But boys, girls, they grow up stronger than children who live in apartments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I like my childhood. It was a surprise to learn that a Mongolian tour guide was a big fan of the NBA, yeah. and he has his favorite players. So from old times, Michael Jordan, Reggie Miller, Reggie Miller, <laughs> yeah. there you go. Ray Allen, Kevin Garnett. There are many of them. So you know your NBA. I, you I mostly do. like those uh, who were uh, great three-point shooters. Oh, yeah, okay. That's why I, I mentioned Reggie. about yes. Reggie Miller. Yeah. It's one of my top. Nemo says NBA basketball is big with Mongolian youth. The next morning, we woke to a burned-out fire and frigid temperatures, so the walk to the long drop was brisk. After breakfast, we tried our hand at the traditional Mongolian sport of archery before heading back to Ulaanbaatar, where the train awaited. The 30-hour trip from Ulaanbaatar to Beijing is the last leg of our journey on the train. During this particular trek, we met Carlos and Herman from the Netherlands and Christian from Germany, who were all on the same route that we were. <laughs> so yeah. why are you doing this? Why, why are you taking this trip? Yeah, so it's a holiday, for, and we started in Moscow, and the uh, final destination for us at least is uh, Beijing. Uh-huh. Uh, wanted to do this for a long time already. Yeah, part, part of the list. Uh, yeah, part of the bucket list, yeah. <laughs> uh, favorite part so far? Um, the last stop in Ulaanbaatar and yeah, to go out to the Normans and yeah, just to see the girl camps and how they live in. And this was awesome to see uh, because it's so far away from our understanding of living and uh, right. yeah, cooking yeah. and yeah. Oh yeah. Just have no... Uh, <laughs> Nothing to do, more or less, yeah, no no work, and this kind, <laughs> we know work, yeah. Right. So that's it, yeah. Um, my least favorite part, four days without a shower. Did that bother oh, you? No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, not, not at all. <laughs> no, uh, it's okay. One of those things you can give up, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The first day you did the shower after the train was uh, heaven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, wasn't it? This section of the railway rolls through Mongolia's Gobi Desert. Yep, that's a desert, all right. It would be our last overnight on the train, but it was a long overnight. We got to the Mongolia-China border at about 10 p.m., where we had to get off the train with all of our luggage and go through passport control and wait for them to change the wheels to the different track gauge used in China. The whole process took about five hours. Our time on the Trans-Siberian, Trans-Mongolian Railway was coming to an end. By midday the next day, we started to see the outskirts of Beijing, followed by the skyscrapers of downtown. We had visited the Chinese capital 16 years before, and it was big then, but it's a monster now, with an interesting mix of old and new. Not far from the Forbidden City, which was home to Chinese emperors for almost 600 years, are brand spanking new gigantic shopping malls. But the site that cannot be missed is a short drive outside the city. The Great Wall of China truly is one of the great wonders of the world. Actually a series of fortifications, the original wall was begun as early as the 7th century BC, but none of that remains. Most of the wall that you can visit today was built beginning in the 14th century by the Ming Dynasty. Believed to have been built for defense and border control, it stretches an unbelievable 5,500 miles across northern mountains. It's not an easy walk on the wall with lots of steps and climbing. The higher you go, the more spectacular the view. This 76-year-old woman made the journey for the first time with her grandson, and he says they loved it. First time on the wall? Yeah, first time, the first time trick here. Yeah, and you loved it? You love it? It's love beautiful. It, yes. it is. It's just beautiful. Very huge. And, and, she, and she know, she know the, the story of this, this place. Uh-huh. She yeah. knows the story? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, she interested uh, at this place. Uh-huh. Yes. And she's told it to you? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, tell yeah. me the story. So I tell him to hear. Ah. <laughs> the Great Wall in every way takes your breath away. Perhaps the only other Beijing attraction that can possibly rival the Great Wall is the giant pandas. China's national symbol is so popular that they have their own pavilion at the Beijing Zoo. 
every single panda in the world belongs to China. That's because giant pandas in the wild are only found in the remote mountainous regions of central China. Pandas aren't really the cuddly creatures they appear to be. They can be dangerous. Although the ones at the zoo appear to enjoy sleeping most of the time. The Chinese are crazy about their pandas. The pavilion is packed with people, and the gift shop is full of tons of panda stuffed animals and other toys. Even goofy American tourists get into the act. One of the most popular ways for locals to get around Beijing is by bicycle. But given the number of cars, pedestrians, and other bikes, riding a bicycle in this crowded, unfamiliar city is not for the faint of heart. So, of course, we decided to give it a shot. Without the app on our phone to rent the public bikes, we got an assist from several nearby hotel workers, and we were on our way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. I think we're ready now. We finally got our bikes. Okay. And I'm all set because I've got my backpack, bottle of water, and just in case we have to make a stop somewhere because we're in China, toilet paper. Okay. But the most important thing is our travel insurance paid up. <laughs> Even with dedicated lanes for bicycles and motorcycles, it was still no picnic with close calls a common occurrence. John decided caution was the better part of valor, letting the man in the wheelchair smoke him off the starting line. There's no denying that for the average American who's never been to Beijing, the name Tiananmen Square probably conjures images of the 1989 uprising with tanks, protesters, and the iconic Tank Man. And while there's still an unmistakable police presence and high security getting into the square, the atmosphere we found on this typical Sunday afternoon 30 years later was clearly more relaxed. The enormous 100-acre space sits in the geographic center of the city and was filled with families and tourists doing what families and tourists do in parks and squares all over the world. Snapping selfies, taking pictures, in this case in front of the nearby Forbidden City, and uh, doing whatever it is this woman is doing. As you can see, the Chinese start their selfie game from an early age. And one of the locals took a particular liking to Anne and included her in an impromptu video selfie. In general, we found the Chinese people friendly, welcoming, and always eager for a picture with their foreign visitors. We were at the end of our more than two-week journey and had come a very long way. We had not only traveled 5,000 miles by train, we had experienced three distinctly different cultures. But as our Russian guide, Isa, who has led this trip several times previously, has discovered, people are people. Despite all the differences, and we are really very different cultures, and even lifestyle is different, no matter how global, globalized we are now, we're still all people. So you still see the same thing everywhere. People travel for lots of different reasons. We do it for the education, because travel is an education like none other. It brings history alive, it makes geography personal, and it is a cultural bridge. It's about knowing what a place on the other side of the globe feels like, it's about the people you meet along the way, the faces you remember, and the memories you create. It's about how people react to you when they find out that you were American, and what fun it can be to discuss politics with people whose government is different than your own. They may not look like you, and they may live differently, but they are still people. Perhaps the most important lesson, though, is what you learn about yourself. Travel can test your fortitude, your patience, and give you more insight into what you are capable of doing. It may not always be easy, but it's definitely worthwhile. Sometimes, though, it is just about the journey. <laughs>